Good morning. Well, it is great to be back with you again this week. We had a huge last couple weeks in our family. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, he blessed us with our fourth child, uh, Caroline Ann, and we're so thankful that she is healthy and my wife Catherine is doing well. Um, feels like the last week and a half has been about two months. So uh, this is kind of weird, to be honest with you, but it's great to be back. Um, success stories, they have a way of drawing us in, don't they? When we hear about someone who is successful or we observe someone who's successful, we, we're, we can become curious about how they got to where they got, right? I don't know about you, but when I see someone who's really good at something, I'm curious. How did they do that? What were the decisions they made? What led to them being where they are? Um, and, and oftentimes, uh, success stories that are incredibly fun to observe are those uh, of people with very humble beginnings, who had lots of obstacles and hardships, and you would never expect that they got to where they were. One of my favorites in the Bible is the story of David. Uh, first, first Samuel 16 tells us David was the youngest of eight boys. They lived in a country town, uh, Bethlehem, and, and they, the, their family was uh, involved in a very hard, challenging, dangerous, unpopular job. They were shepherds. All right, so if you just pause for a second and think about David, one of the greatest kings in the history of all humanity started off as the youngest of eight boys, country boy, uh, shepherding family. You would never expect that he would be the king. Uh, the second greatest king of Israel behind, obviously, the son of David, the son of God, Jesus Christ. All right? So, so we love success stories, but what is the opposite of a success story? What is the opposite? The opposite is a tragic story, a story of defeat, a story of failure. And, and there's a series of decisions that usually led someone into a story of failure. But an underlying observation usually, as we look at a story that's disappointing, is that there were expectations that were not met. That we look at something and we view it as a failure because they failed to meet the expectations that were given to them. Expectations kind of are a huge factor in how we evaluate whether something is, is successful or something is a failure. Because if, if you have very low expectations, if something turns out average, you're happy, right? But if you have very high expectations and it's not like perfect, you're disappointed. One of the clearest examples for this for me as a sports fan is the NCAA basketball tournament, March Madness, which usually happens in March, but this year did not. Um, and uh, every year there's always a one seed that plays a 16 seed. Now, when the 16 seed loses, generally speaking, nobody cares because they were expected to lose, right? Expectations dictate the way you view that. But if a number one seed lost, you'd be like, what just happened, right? It's all about expectations. Expectations are huge. So when a person is given ample opportunity to succeed and they're given many, many opportunities to do what is right and to do it well and to achieve and they continually fail to do so, the typical reaction is frustration, disappointment. They didn't meet the expectations that we thought of them. And usually when we're observing that, it's very easy to sit in the observing seat. Why can't they get it right? <laughs> Why are they not meeting expectations? And it's a lot harder to sit in the seat that's being observed when people are saying, why aren't you getting it right, right? And Something that has to do with expectations is the perspective of who's setting the expectations, right? And, and I think it's very fruitful for us to evaluate ourselves. Are we meeting the expectations we should be having as a human being, right? Uh, as a spouse, as a parent, as a member in a church community. But something that we must never forget is the expectations that God has for us in our relationship with him. We should be asking, how is my relationship with the Lord? Not, am I reading my Bible? Not, am I going to church? Not, am I being a nice person? But how is my relationship with him? And am I living the life that he is expecting of me. 
Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. We are officially halfway there. <laughs> Luke has 24 chapters. We began our study in December. It's October. We're halfway there. I'm excited. Today in our text, we'll be looking at both judgments and expectations. And Jesus is challenging his audience to spend more time assessing their own lives than judging other people's lives. And he's also bringing into consideration the expectations that the Lord has for those who have been given a great privilege. So let's begin our text, chapter 13 and verse 1. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him, that is Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now, it would be very easy just to read that verse and go straight on to the next verse, but we got to stop for a second, because these people came up and they reported to Jesus about a group of Galileans, which were Jewish people in the northern area. Basically, it was like Judea in the south, Samaria in the middle, and Galileans in the north. So there was these Galileans who had been offering sacrifices, which probably would have been around the time of the Passover. They would have been down in Jerusalem, and it says that Pilate mixed their blood with the sacrifices. Now, we got to understand what's going on because it's very, very easy for us to, I don't really care about that. But they would have really cared about that because Pilate was the Roman governor and there was a lot of animosity between Pilate and the nation, the Jews. They didn't like each other. And, and there's many instances that we see in history where there was some enmity between those two groups. And the Jewish people really valued their sacrifices and the blood was very symbolic of life. So for, for Pilate to have his soldiers kill Jews while they're offering sacrifices in the temple and then the blood of the animals and the blood of the humans mixing together, this would have been an outrage. People would, this, this would not be something that people had not heard. This would have been very well known and people would have had very strong opinions about it. So this could have been a situation that could have turned very political to see what is Jesus going to do. It could have turned into a trap. Kind of like when someone tried to trap Jesus and they said, should you pay taxes to Caesar? Remember how Jesus responded? Well, give the things to Caesar that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God. Jesus never gets backed into a corner, even if they try to. Jesus is never in a catch-22. He always finds himself exactly where he wants to be, and he doesn't succumb to any kind of potential trap that someone may be having for him. We're not exactly sure if this was a trap report, but it very possibly could have been. So someone probably wants to see how's he going to respond. If he's very pro-Galilean, that, that would imply he's very anti-Roman. And if he's very pro-Roman, then his own brethren are going to say, well, hey, I thought you were one of us. Why are you letting Pilate off the hook? So Jesus could have turned this political, but that's not what he does. Look at verse 2. Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Instead of making this a political thing, Jesus makes it a theological thing. And he says, well, do you think that they're greater sinners because they experienced this tragedy? And, and why would Jesus ask that question? I think Jesus asked that question because that's probably what they were thinking, right? They probably were thinking, well, man, they, they probably deserved it. And we know in Scripture that kind of theology comes out sometimes. In John chapter 9, Jesus' own disciples ask Jesus when they see a man born blind, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus says, neither of them. <laughs> it was so that the works of God could be demonstrated. Or remember in the story of Job, Job's friends basically said, God doesn't punish righteous people. In Job chapter 4, his friend Eliphaz says, remember now, whoever perished being innocent. Oh, where were the upright destroyed? But later on in Job chapter 42, the Lord spoke to that man Eliphaz and he says, my wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends because you have not spoken about me what is right. It's bad theology to always assume 
that if you do something bad or something bad happens to you, it's because you did something bad to deserve it. That's not always true. Now, sometimes in Scripture that is true, right? Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Gross sin, immorality, God brought judgment. Think about Ananias and Sapphira, right? They lied to the Holy Spirit, and God brought judgment upon them. So sometimes there is direct judgment because of sin, but sometimes it may have nothing to do with a sin issue. And I think Jesus is saying, you need to stop worrying about judging somebody else. Unless you repent, you likewise will perish. And let's keep reading, because I think he expounds upon this. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now he uses another example, something that happened in Jerusalem that was an accident, and apparently a tower had fallen over and killed 18 people, and he says, well, did they die because they were worse sinners than you? <laughs> no. And I love how John Calvin, he's got a great quote on this. He says, this passage is highly useful were it not for no other reason than that this, this disease is almost natural to us to be too rigorous and severe in judging of others and too much disposed to flatter our own faults. And then he goes on to say, basically, when something bad happens to someone else, it can be natural for us to think they probably deserved it. And then when something good is happening to us, it can be easy for us to think, well, I probably deserved it too. <laughs> and, and, and I think that Jesus is saying, you don't know all the facts. And stop wasting your time judging other people. Think about what does God expect of you? And he says, unless you repent, you likewise will perish. Repent is a huge word. And we got to know what is he talking about? Because literally the word means change of mind, change of perspective. And throughout the scriptures, there's different examples of repentance. Sometimes it deals with a nation, a corporate group of people. They need to repent as a group. But sometimes repentance has to do with an individual, right? And other times in scripture, repentance has to do with something where a person acknowledges their sin before God and it leads them to place their saving faith in Christ. And they're saved by grace through faith. But other times, repentance in the Bible has to do with a believer who's already saved. And that repentance draws them back into fellowship with God. So what does he mean by repentance? And I think repentance throughout Scripture is a genuine, sincere acknowledgement of guilt. I am wrong. But it doesn't just stay looking at me. It's always looking at the Lord as the one who will provide the deliverance out of that. I am wrong. Save me. I love in Luke 18, a man is praying to the Lord, and he says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Acknowledgement, I'm wrong. Looking to him to show mercy upon me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. So what, what, what kind of repentance are we dealing with right here, right now? And I think at this moment in history, I think that Jesus is expecting, word expectation, a repentance from the nation as a whole. That for the most part, the nation as a whole has rejected him. And throughout Scripture, mainly in the Old Testament, we see that God has an expectation of repentance of his people, and when they fail to do that, there's judgment. Think about the northern kingdom of Israel. God was wanting them to change the way they viewed their sin and to look to him in faith. And they never did. So, or they rarely did. He sent the Assyrians in 722. The southern kingdom of Judah. God was expecting the people to repent and look to him in faith. And for the most part, they didn't. So he sent the Babylonians in 586. And here, he's expecting these people to receive his Messiah. And for the most part, they didn't. So let's keep reading. Verse 6, Jesus begins to tell a parable. And when Jesus tells a parable, and it's right in the context of his teaching, usually the parable helps explain what he just said. All right? So let's pay attention to this parable. He began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree 
which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. So we have a man who plants a fig tree in a vineyard. Now, when you see fig tree and vineyard together in Scripture, that's probably a sign that there's a linkage of something else. And, and, and oftentimes Israel is viewed as a vine, as a vineyard. Isaiah 5 talks about God planting a vineyard and it's Israel. And in Isaiah 5, he plants this vineyard and it says, I expected to see good fruit and I only see worthless fruit. And we see here that this man who owns a vineyard comes and he's looking for fruit, which means there's an expectation that that tree's going to have fruit. And yet that expectation is unmet because it doesn't have any. Now, if this was just a tree that's planted to look pretty, he's probably going to be fine with it. I don't care if it has fruit or not because it looks pretty or it provides shade in this area. But that's not the tree that, that it is. It's a fig tree. And the fig tree is supposed to have figs. So he comes and he looks and he doesn't see any figs. So he says to the vineyard keeper, behold, for three years I've been coming or I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put it in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. So there's an expectation that this fig tree is going to have fruit. And then because it doesn't have fruit, he says, well, why am I wasting my time on it? And then there's a vineyard dresser who says, wait, give it one more year. Give it one more chance. I'll give it special attention, special care. I'll dig around it. I'll put fertilizer on it. And let's give it a little bit more time. And maybe it will bear fruit. And if not, you can cut it down. Now, remember how I talked about the vineyard, the fig tree, like probably seems to be representing Israel. Later on in Matthew 21, Jesus walks by a fig tree, separate instance, and he looks for fruit. There's an expectation again that there's fruit, and it doesn't have any fruit. So Jesus curses it, and it withers. God is expecting his fig trees to bear fruit. And I love Dr. Dwight Pentecost has a great line on this. He says, God, the owner of the vineyard, had planted Israel as his fruitful tree. Jesus Christ was the vine dresser. For three years he had been calling Israel to repentance, but Israel had not repented to bring forth the fruit of righteousness. Therefore, Israel was to be cut off. That is brought under national judgment. Now, I always want to be careful when I see numbers in the Bible because I, I kind of can get off in the weeds and, and this is not inspired, but Jesus, his ministry was about three years. And, and he's expecting about three years to see the fruit there. Now, a fig tree, I've been, I've been told, usually you don't even expect fruit for the first three years of its life. But then after year three, you should expect fruit. So however old this fig tree is, we don't know. But for three years, there's an expectation that that fig tree is going to bear fruit. And you could even say that during Jesus' ministry, it would be reasonable to assume that as Jesus is going around performing healings all over the place and preaching all over the place and miracles all over the place, that the majority of the nation would receive him and say, he's our Messiah. But that's not what happened. They wanted to do it their own way. They wanted to be righteous in their own way. Isn't that a danger for us too? To think that we have to be right with God by what we do to please Him? And the message of the Bible is you cannot be right with God in your own way. You can only be right with God through Christ. By receiving Christ by grace through faith and trusting in what Jesus did for you on the cross. And if you have trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you're at peace with God. That means you're right with God. And then now you have the possibility of walking with God and experiencing the peace of God. But think about the incredible privilege the nation Israel had experienced. 
They were the people that God had chosen. He chose Abraham and his family. And God was using for centuries this family to reach the nations. And these people had been entrusted, Paul says in Romans 3, with the oracles of God. These people had prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. These people had the word of God, the law, the writings, the prophets. They had it all, and Jesus was right in front of them. And they rejected him. Of all the people that have the highest expectations that you will respond to the Messiah, was it not that generation at that time that Jesus was literally right in front of them? And they did not bear fruit. Now, I think it's interesting that the last verse doesn't tell us what happened. And if it bears fruit, fine, but if not, cut it down. It's open-ended. Now, we know from history, did that nation generally at that time respond to Messiah? No. They did not. And although that I think that Jesus was calling for a national repentance and that there was a national judgment, the Romans came in 70 and trampled Jerusalem, that nation was made up of individuals who individually rejected Messiah. An individual rejection of Jesus causes you to fall under the condemnation of God. John 3, 18 says, He who believes in him, that's the Son, is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If you have rejected Christ, you will experience the wrath of God. But if you have trusted in Christ, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And I believe that as we look at this passage, even though I think it has nationalistic implications in the context of that passage, I think there's great application for us as believers, right? As a New Testament person, believer who's trusted in the finished work of Christ, I think it's fair to ask ourselves the question, am I walking with the Lord the way that he wants me to walk? I think it's fair to ask the question, am I living the life with him that he is expecting of me? And I would say he has a lot of expectations for us. Ephesians 1 says that the believer has been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Jesus tells us that I don't leave you alone that I will leave my helper with you, the Holy Spirit. Every believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means not only do you have God in you and God with you, Emmanuel, but you have God for you, and now you have the power to walk in the Spirit, to not live in the flesh, but to live in the Spirit. And you have an expectation from God that you will walk with Him. In John 15, Jesus uses this example of a vine and branches again. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I in you, and you will bear fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Which should be a huge warning to us that even then in our great desire to bear fruit, we can't do it in our own strength. You know, I find it interesting that the Bible ne never tells us to produce fruit. It tells us to bear fruit. Producing fruit is the work of God. He's the one who has the life that can produce fruit in us. We're called to abide in him and to bear the fruit that he produces. We're called to abide, to dwell, to remain with him. That means to be close with him. And to be the opposite of that is to be separated from him or to have something hindering your fellowship with him. So what barrier in your life is hindering your fellowship with Christ? And that could be a good thing or a bad thing. A bad thing is easy to identify, a sin. <laughs> what person, place, thing, hobby, habit is causing you to sin? 
And as I would see from the text today, he says, repent. That means acknowledge it's wrong, but don't stop at your own heart. Look to him for help and say, God, help me with this sin. Root this out of my life. I cannot do this on my own. I need you to take it out of my life. Ask God for help because he will help you. Ask him for help. What barrier is causing you to have some distance between you and the Lord? Identify that, repent of it, acknowledge this is wrong, I have sinned. Be merciful to me, God, help me with this. I look to you in faith. Now, what about a good thing in your life that's causing a, a, a hindrance between you and the Lord? Is it security that you find in something? Is it in money? Is it in a relationship? Is it in family? This is my security. This is what I hope in. Because that's going to cause a wedge between you and God because our hope is to be in the Lord, not in anything else. Okay? Is it a hobby? A good hobby? God, God blesses us with desires to do good things. But is your hobby taking too much time away from your walk with God? Is it stealing your affections so that all you think about is that you want to get to that hobby? You want to get to that lake house or you want to get to whatever instead of the Lord being the primary focus of what you think about. What is causing you to have a wedge between you and the Lord? Identify it, repent of it, ask God for help. It's wrong. Say, I'm wrong. I'm sinning in this. Lord, help me. And then I want us to think about the expectations as we close today. God has great expectations of his followers. I love how Jesus says in John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. Are you living the life that God is expecting of you? I believe that he wants you to bear fruit. If you are a believer in Jesus, he wants you to bear fruit, and the fruit that you bear is fruit that he will produce in you as you remain with him. Will you bear fruit? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this passage that although the context seems to be about a nation at that time in history, that you had great expectations of them. I believe there's great application for us as believers today that you too expect fruit from us. You have given us great privilege as believers to be at peace with you and to walk in a newness of life. And I ask that every believer in here would pray with me and say, Lord God, I repent of any sin in my life. I acknowledge it is wrong and I ask that you would help me, that you would give me strength to remain and to abide in you and that I would not try to do things in my own strength to please you, but I would just try to abide in you and that I would allow you to work in my life, to give me strength to walk in your spirit. Lord God, I ask for help in that. And I ask that I would bear much fruit with you and that I would be living the life that you are expecting of me. And that when you look at my life, you would be looking at a tree that has fruit, not a tree without fruit. And if there's one here who's not a believer, who's never trusted in Christ, and you would like to right now, I ask that you pray with me right now and say, God, I'm a sinner. I acknowledge I am wrong and that you are absolutely right in how wrong I am. And I fully deserve your wrath. But I believe in Jesus as my Savior and what he did for me at the cross. And he was raised from the dead. He was victorious. He accomplished the work for which he came. He came and he saved me from my sin. And I receive him as my Savior, and I believe in him, Lord, and I trust in you. And I'm so thankful that I've been given new life in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.